I'm Toss Cochran. I am the Director of Neuroethics at the Center for Bioethics, and I'm glad to welcome you all here for the first time, or if not, welcome back from the summer. I hope you all had a lovely summer. Um, I'm very excited about the topic for tonight's Neuroethics Seminar. Uh, I think it's a great way to kick off the uh, fall uh, series. We've got a number of topics uh, this fall. Tonight's is called At the Frontier, the Ethics of Innovative Neurosurgery. Um, but before I dive into the topic and introduce our uh, speakers and commentators, let me just sort of give you a flavor of what's to come for the rest of the fall. On Tuesday, September 29th, we have a seminar on the ethics of disordered consciousness uh, and the implications of neuroimaging in uh, disorders of consciousness. Uh, on Wednesday, October 21st, the topic is uh, DIY brain sti uh, stimulation, and we have our guest speaker is Julian Savulescu from, Os from Oxford. On Thursday, November 5th, we'll be talking about uh, the ethics of presumed consent to IVTPA in acute stroke. And then December 3rd, we're going to be talking about brain-computer interfaces. So we've got an uh, exciting lineup, and uh, hopefully uh, you, can, you can return uh, if you're able. I want to acknowledge our, uh, the, the entities that make this possible uh, through their financial support, and those are the Mind Brain Behavior Interfaculty Initiative here at Harvard, and the Harvard Brain Initiative Collaborative Seed Grant Program. We're also supported by the International uh, Neuroethics Society, which supports our ability to webcast uh, these seminars. Uh, so in a moment, I'm going to describe the case that we're going to be used to focus our remarks ar about uh, innovative neurosurgery. Um, but first, let me introduce our uh, commentators tonight. Uh, Paul Ford is our visiting professor. He is the director of the Neuroethics Program and the education director for the Department of Bioethics at the Cleveland Clinic and is associate professor in the medical school at Case Western. He has a PhD in philosophy and is a professional ethicist. He's an ex extremely experienced ethics consultant. And his primary research interests center on ethical issues raised by neurosurgical interventions, uh, which makes him a perfect commentator for us. Uh, he also uh, brings us the case that we're going to be using. For more than 10 years, he's been part of a deep brain stimulator team and the epilepsy surgery program, uh, providing ethical advice in clinical cases and on research. Our second commentator is uh, Dr. Darren Doherty, who is an associate professor of psychiatry here at uh, Harvard and at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's the director of the neurotherapeutics division in the Department of Psychiatry at MGH and the Associate Director of the MGH Psychiatric Neuroimaging Group. He co-directs the Harvard Catalyst Master's Program in Clinical and Translational Investigation and co-chairs the, the MGH Psychiatric Neurosurgery Committee. And as you'll see, that makes him likewise a perfect commentator uh, for tonight's uh, session. Uh, and last but not least is Elizabeth Homan. Libby is an Associate Professor of Medicine and an expert in infectious disease at MGH. She's an experienced researcher in her own right, but more uh, importantly for our purposes tonight, uh, she is the chair and physician director of the Partners Human Research Committees, the IRBs at Partners Hospitals, uh, which is a big job and you've held it for many years. So very experienced in the regulatory aspects of uh, innovative neurosurgery and other, and other research. So with that said, uh, I'm going to introduce the case for tonight and then let our speakers take it from there. Uh, our case has to do with consideration of deep brain stimulation for an adolescent with Tourette's syndrome. A little background on Tourette's syndrome. Uh, it is a spontaneous disorder characterized by motor and phonic tics with an onset in childhood. Uh, the severity often peaks in early adolescence, although about a third uh, will improve as they uh, become adults. Some patients are disabled with respect to daily functioning, uh, partly because of the social aspects of their tics. They can be quite visible <laughs> and audible uh, and can interrupt social functioning. Some of them are actually painful uh, and can interrupt with physical, interrupt physical function. Uh, so it can be a very, very severe uh, disorder. There's a high rate of mental health comorbidities associated with disease. In particular, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder has a high prevalence among patients with Tourette's syndrome, but depression and attention deficit disorders are also common in, in that population. Uh, deep brain stimulation, which Paul will introduce to us a little bit uh, more shortly, 
is a technique that has been used in Tourette's syndrome, although not in a very large cohort of patients. About 120 patients have received uh, DBS. Um, only nine of them were under 18. Uh, and it is the experience of people doing this is that, that there is symptom improvement, uh, but the evidence is still class three. And so uh, we don't have any scientific proof in scare quotes uh, that it improves symptoms. There is no standard brain location for the insertion of the DBS leads. Uh, the basal ganglia um, is the most common uh, location of stimulation. Uh, and then there are thalamic targets as well. Uh, the case for tonight is, um, a, what is it right to say it's a slightly fictionalized case uh, that uh, Dr. Ford brings to us. Uh, the patient we'll call Mike is 15 and was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome at age 10. He has motor and phonic tics uh, that include severe head snapping tics, so head movements that, uh, that can be very disruptive. And they can actually be dangerous uh, if they're severe enough, they can actually cause trauma to the neck, and in severe cases, they can cause dissection of arteries in the neck. Uh, a panel of experts in movement disorders agreed, uh, viewed video of his symptoms and agreed that his tics were related to Tourette's syndrome, uh, but it seemed to them that some of his head snapping behavior was likely embellished and included a psychogenic component. His tics have worsened to a level that he is now homeschooled, uh, which is something that uh, he and his family and the school district agreed was necessary. So it gives you a flavor of the severity of his tics. His family is worried about his social and emotional development, quite naturally, as well as the potential health consequences of the tics. He's tried all of the major classes of medical therapies without uh, uh, sufficient relief. The family, it's been suggested that he undergo cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a standard part of the therapy for uh, Tourette's syndrome. Uh, but the family doesn't believe in psychological therapies and has rejected the idea of uh, CBT. Mike saw a news story that reported uh, deep brain stimulation as, again in scare quotes, curing a man of his Tourette's. Uh, he's under the impression that this is a miracle technology uh, and he just wants to have a normal life. Um, and he is constantly asking his parents uh, if he can receive the surgery. The medical center in our hypothetical discussion tonight has an active deep brain stimulation program, uh, but no current active research protocol for DBS in Tourette's syndrome. Uh, the parents have reluctantly brought Mike to be evaluated for DBS. Uh, there are any number of ethical questions that we could ask at this point, and I'm not going to uh, try and set that up. I'm going to leave that job to uh, Paul Ford. Uh, and unless there are any fact questions about the case, I will sit down and leave it to Paul. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, the last, last little bit of detail. Uh, the Tourette syndrome specialist who evaluated him thinks that his tics are unlikely to remit, but there's, there's no scientific method for knowing whose tics will remit. And there also aren't any uh, studies that tell us what the long-term implications of DBS in young patients with Tourette's syndrome are. There is some experience in children who receive DBS for dystonia. Uh, Thanks. Yes? I, just, I wasn't sure if maybe you were going to, but if you could tell us a little bit more about the device and the... Paul's going to tell us a, a bit about that, and that's you. So I'll, uh, I'll tell, um, I'll say a, a, a bit about the device and... Um, Dr. Doherty will uh, be able to uh, fill in the, the details that I guess uh, for more sophistication to Lovely, thank you. So thank you, Toss, and uh, um, thanks to the program for inviting me. It's a delight to be here. I had an opportunity to visit uh, uh, Mass General a number of years ago and sit in on the uh, the um, psychiatric, neuropsychiatric surgery uh, committee, which is the long, longest standing program, um, multidisciplinary program for these kind of neuropsychiatric surgeries and uh, uh, done very well. So it was a delight to come and, and participate with this group. You know, I want to say a minute more about thank yous. I think it's good to be appreciative of, uh, of uh, where you've come from. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who have helped educate me being a philosopher in neurosurgery, neuropsychological, il psychiatric illnesses, um, challenges, and the decisions that arise from these. 
Um, I'm also humbled by the opportunity to help clinicians, families, patients um, make some of these tough decisions. And so, you know, most of all, I put patients and families first because they trust often to, to disclose things and, and allow me to help with some of the decisions. So the case we have today is one that is published in the literature and then I added in elements from the various families that I've met with. To, so all the elements are true, it just wasn't a single patient. And although sometimes we meet patients that have all these complexities all in one. Um, and certainly the clinicians, I, too many to list, but pediatric psychiatrists like Tatiana Falcone, um, adult psychiatrist Dr. Jimenez, Malone, Pandia, neurosurgeons like Dr. Machado, uh, neuropsychologists like Dr. Kabu, um, neurologists, these all collaborate and help me understand. So I want to frame this and give a framing for the discussion today of justifications. So when I think of ethics, I think of um, scenarios, dilemmas where we're forced to balance values in an appropriate way. What values are we going to preserve? Which values are we going to give up that are important to us, important to our patients? So the, the three framings that I'll use as a theme for this, um, we want to ask ourselves, what is the justification for offering a surgery to this, this child and family? Um, if we offer it, what's the justification for which framework that we're going to use in order to say how we're going to perform it? And then finally, and this may be a little bit different than usual, what's our justification for putting special conditions or requirements on the patient in order to get the surgery? Uh -huh. That's probably the the most unusual of these, uh, these three. So just a very thumbnail, layman's um, understanding of deep brain stimulation. So people often talk about it as a pacemaker for the brain. And in fact, uh, one of the largest manufacturers you know, took a heart pacemaker, modified it, refined it. Um, there's a generator that gets implanted in your chest. It's hooked to wires that there's burr holes, usually on two sides, sometimes unilateral, um, but often bilateral. And then electrodes are placed deep in the brain, usually around the basal ganglia. For, um, and then there's, for at least the, the standard indications, high frequency continuous stimulation um, into the brain. Uh, indications include uh, um, essential tremor, Parkinson's, uh, human device exemptions for dystonia and OCD. And then there's lots of experimental uh, experiments. Um, but those are the, the main, the biggest, the biggest experience, 100,000, almost 200,000 DBS leads implanted uh, worldwide. Okay, so I'm gonna frame even more and frame what the salient features I wanna pull out of the case that I thought are particularly important. It's deep brain stimulation for Tourette's, an approved device, but not approved for, for this indication. We really have limited availability of, of data available. Um, Shrek et al. writing for a big collaborative in movement disorders just this spring had this wonderful review of all of the, the published cases. And again, um, in your case write-up, those are number of published instances. We don't know how many people are actually doing this off-label, but at least they found those numbers as a minimum. <laughs> this is a 15-year-old with a developing brain. Um, the other interesting thing about the Shrek et al. article is that they reversed their stance on whether kids should be eligible potentially for DBS for Tourette's. The previous iteration of this, this group was it shouldn't be done under, under 25. They moved that to say with special consideration and special oversight, it is permissible. Uh, this is in a, a little bit of contrast to the 1977 psychosurgery, and, and that's the, uh, the term they used in 1977 report that um, sort of suggested that children ought not to be, and if they are, you needed a, at least a court, a, a court um, a finding that, that they, they'd be eligible for. And we have this interesting developmental window. So people say, why not wait? Well, we have this developmental window that we're shaped deeply in our adolescent years for the rest of our lives. Opportunity to educate, opportunity to, to socialize, um, developing, you know, developing brain an opportunity. Uh, this idea of managing expectations, you saw media, magical thinking, the, uh, the team's expectations. And then this twist I threw in about, potentially some of these are psychogenic, psychological, functional uh, movements that 
might not be helped with, uh, with a, a surgery, and the family, for whatever beliefs, core beliefs, religious or otherwise, is rejecting cognitive behavioral therapy, the very therapy that's most likely to help with a psychogenic uh, component. So we, we have some contrasting values at stake here. So again, justifications. I'm going to start with the, uh, very quickly with the justifying um, offering surgery, and then I'll go through the, uh, the other three. But I want you to ask yourself, what's at stake in, in making these decisions of, of which framework, which uh, offering, which, which uh, requirements? Who has something at stake? And what are the values, either lost or preserved? So justifying the, the even offering. So the, you know, oftentimes committees like, uh, like the one here at, uh, at Harvard, they meet, and the first stage is even whether it's, it's ethically justifiable within their conscience even to offer the surgery to this, uh, this child and the family. Um, you know, and, and we use some of the, the, the usual kinds of things. Is there a reasonable chance of benefit? Well, is a developmental benefit enough justification when it's not a life-threatening condition? In the case that was given, there could be an avoidance of physical harm if he's snapping his, uh, his neck. As, uh, um, is it only going to be for those who have physical harm that we're going to offer this to, or is this developmental enough? Um, does the dystonia experience or the adult threat experience really translate to the kids? My pediatric colleagues tell me, make sure that I know that kids aren't little adults. They're different, particularly their brains developing in different ways. So what's, uh, do we... Do we know the uncertainties involved of a lifelong of, of deep brain stimulation in this kind of brain? Um, and are you going to exacerbate those other potential underlying psych psychological illnesses? Or are you going to unmask more? And then we can look at this not just for this type of patient, now this, per this, this kid's specific circumstances. And then I want to say that every center should ask themselves, is this the right center to do this? If our focus is a lot of other things, maybe there's a center a thousand miles away that, that specializes in this. And we have to have the, the humility sometimes to say the higher volume center might be a better fit for, uh, for this indication. So once you decide, yeah, okay, we're going to offer it, and let's say our team thinks it's justified to offer it to this, uh, this, this family, this patient. Um, the next step, I think, is to say where along the innovation and research continuum does it fall? Under what conditions? Am I going to offer it simply as an off-label use just for this person's benefit? And every decision will be based just on what I think is going to maximize the benefit of this kid. And I list up on the, the, the screen you know, what I see as, as uh, various versions of this. And a continuum, not, it's not binary. It's not either research or you know, maybe you do it and then you uh, submit, there's a big uh, registry, data registry, national data registry, international data registry now that they've created for threats. Maybe you submit and then you send all the information to this registry and that part is research. Or maybe you add a few extra tests or you know, how much extra do you do to say, okay, if we're gonna do it in one, we need to learn and benefit others. Right down to the full, should this only be done in a rigorous, controlled, randomized, sham or placebo controlled trial. That decision then will carry through all of the rest of the decisions you make. Right? In terms of the framework, it, it says what kind of consent process. If you're going to do a full controlled trial with a sham, you may require a greater level of consent. Maybe that's where you do actually involve a, a, a court appointed uh, person. I, I doubt that that's really needed in most places. But, uh, but this will change. Particularly in a, a, an adolescent, that this is a quality of life surgery. You're going to put their life at some risk, small, but any neurosurgery has its, its, its risk. You know, is this, is this justified and what consent would we need? Um, and then what evaluation process? How rigorously, how many hoops do you have the, uh, the patient come through? You know, I want to say just a, a minute about vulnerability. It's easy to say, well, this, uh, this child is vulnerable. And you know, this was a, a definition that I, I, I like um, put together. I think vulnerability is when you run into a circumstance where the usual safeguards for fair and just um, action aren't usually sufficient enough. 
right? So vulnerability should be just a signal to say the usual circumstances aren't going to protect fairness and justice the right way. So do we need to not do it or maybe just put in new safeguards? Um, and vulnerability, I think, is, is negatively associated with both voluntariness and appreciation of implications for, uh, for consent. Um, and I also want to stop people from, from using vulnerability as a catch-all term that's, that's a, a conversation stopper. You know, here are six ways. I, uh, Kipnis and a couple of nice articles had list them as seven. I, I reduced it to six. But I want to, if I have a discussion with a surgeon, I, I stop him and say, vulnerable do you mean he's under the control of his parents? Vulnerable in that this fancy institution of the Cleveland Clinic or, the, or Harvard is, uh, is not letting them make good decisions? Is it that they have no option? Which of these vulnerabilities do we need to protect against? Not just one big, big grouping. Okay, my, my final uh, justify. So we've decided that, uh, that we're gonna offer it. We've decided whether it's gonna be um, research or, or clinical practice and what, uh, what kind of innovation, what, where along the spectrum. And then there's this odd dance, I think, that, uh, that we don't often recognize between how we uh, were able to put conditions or requirements on the patient. You know, the conditional is, you will get surgery if, if what? Um, and do patients and families have obligations in this kind of innovative neurosurgery, right? Where you very expensive to do a surgery, lots of resources, um, high risk potentially to the, uh, the institution uh, um, in many ways. Uh, does that put obligations on patients and families? And what do obligations mean in this context? Um, so, what justifies conditions being placed on the patient? You might think some of these might be ones that you'll, you'll trot out. Uh, standards of practice. It's standard of practice to have everyone have a neuropsychiatric evaluation, hence it's a duty to protect. It's, as a, a physician, it's your duty to protect. I have a responsibility to protect the reputation of my program and colleagues so I can continue to help other patients or outcomes, reimbursements attached to outcomes these days. Maybe I have a, a duty to responsibility to, to, to have good outcomes. Um, maybe I have a responsibility to avoid futile or wasteful interventions. Um, maybe I want to say that uh, the patient, in fact, has obligations to others or obligations to others with a similar disorder. You know, I, know I had an interesting conversation with Zeke Emanuel one time where he out, you know, outright rejected that, uh, that one criteria in pediatric research where if it's a benefit to other people with the same disease. Does that hold water? Do any of these justifications hold water and for what kinds of conditions? I'm trying to set this up for a conversation that we can, can draw on these. So what kind of conditions, uh, conditionals might, might we have? Uh, the first one and, and most prominent is you have to fail all other therapies first before we'll offer this innovation. And you already see with the way I wrote this case up, I, I, I tried to call that into question. Is it because this is a last resort therapy that's unlikely to help and so we're going to the need to be sure that uh, everything else has been exhausted? Is it that you have to demonstrate less risky attempts? And you notice I didn't put less invasive. You know, I want to reject less invasive as a good criteria. I think it's less risky because there's lots of things we think of as non-invasive that have pretty significant side effects. I saw a person with a, a saying to toss a um, tardive dyskinesia after a um, antipsychotic, and it was so horrible that, uh, that she was breaking teeth, right? It's not invasive, but, you know. So the metric I want to use is demonstrate less risky have failed, or is it that you want to demonstrate that all proven therapies have failed, hence they, uh, you're not keeping them away from a proven therapy, um, or are you really demonstrating compliance? If we're, if we're going to give you the opportunity to do this, have this expensive, innovative thing, we want you to earn the right. Now, nobody is going to say that outright. I'm trying to get at what's perhaps some of our underneath assumptions we may not recognize. So what kind of conditionals? Um, agree to additional things, safeguards after care, before care. You know, you think about uh, in transplant, there's been some discussion about a parent having to sign over all of their, you know, their decision-making, parental decision-making, because they were non-compliant with their kid. You know, is that a condition that the kind of condition that's justified. 
uh, you have to get these unrelated health benefits that'll be, be beneficial for you, and I'll hold this surgery over the head until you do. Well, over the head, I guess that's a, a, a uh, um, and finally, most interestingly, agree to be a research subject. And I think this is often missed in the conversation that we say, we jump right to, well, we have to do this under research. So research affords perhaps some extra protections, but it also creates an extra burden in most cases. Extra tests, you have to, uh, to share your data, your, your personal information, you have, right? So research has a burden and, uh, um, to it that are we really justified in saying, the only way I'm going to give this to you is if, if we create a little research protocol. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to save, I think, this for, uh, for, for discussion. But simply, I think that uh, outcome measures are pretty important if we're going to study these things. And maybe we need to think about neuropsychiatric uh, um, indications um, as a grouping of domains and symptoms. And we could be satisfied with just helping at least one symptom rather than the HAMD having to be improved all for depression. Maybe it's there's some subscales that would be sufficient, just like in a tremor, um, tremor for Parkinson's. And maybe the severe neuropsychiatric illnesses need a multimodal approach. You know, I, I think of the analog of cancer. You know, many times it's radiation and, and, and uh, chemotherapy, or surgery, radiation, and adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, right? So, you know, I, I push back on these one famous neurosurgeon when he wanted to talk of, uh, of DBS as a cure for OCD without any further therapy. He may be right, what, what do I know, but it, I suspect there are some people who DBS in conjunction with psychiatric therapy might, uh, might be beneficial. So maybe we need to think of this not as one, but as a treatment program. And then you ask yourself, can you order off the menu or is it a package deal? Okay. We need to think about, are we justified in offering the surgery? Are we justified in which framework? And then when we choose a framework, are these conditions we're gonna place on the patient and the patient's families, are they justified and reasonable? So thank you. So Darren, I think that tees us up nicely uh, for what you've got to say. Uh, as I mentioned, you're part of a, a, a group actually doing these, uh, a term that some folks don't like, psychosurgeries at- uh, Psychiatric neurosurgeries. Psychiatric neurosurgeries uh, at MGH. And uh, I think your insights about this case uh, and Paul's remarks would be welcome. Thanks. All right, great. Yes, yeah, so the, the Psychiatric Neurosurgery Committee at MGH has been in place since the 1960s, believe it or not. And I've been part of the committee since 2000, so for 15 years, and currently serve as co-chair with the Maude Eskandar in Neurosurgery. And we meet once a month and we review cases. They have to be referred by a physician. Patients cannot refer themselves. They provide all of the records that we need uh, in order to evaluate the case. Um, and usually at the meeting, will sometimes outright reject, uh, will rarely approve at the first meeting. Usually we, what ends up happening is something in the middle where we either ask for clarification on issues or we have uh, additional recommended treatments before we would proceed with surgery. If they go through all of that, then we will invite them for an on-site evaluation that if it goes well, will end with a surgical procedure. And the committee itself includes neuro, neuro, uh, neurosurgeons, neurologists, and psychiatrists. And all three of those uh, uh, groups see the patient uh, when they come on, in, on site as well. And we reserve the right that if we, if we detect anything during the on-site visit that makes them ineligible to revoke their candidacy. We also do you know, lab tests, neuropsychological testing, brain imaging, et cetera. The majority of our cases are for two indications, and we have two different procedures that we use. The major indications for the Psychiatric Neurosurgery Committee are major depression and OCD. We've done ablative limbic system procedures since the 1960s, which is stereotactic ablation of small areas of the brain that we know that are effective uh, for both OCD and depression. Uh, we've published extensively on that. And that procedure is called an anterior singulotomy and we ablate a small couple of cc's bilaterally, uh, dorsal anterior cingulate tissue, and that's effective. And for many years, that's, that's really what we did. 
With the advent of deep brain stimulation, now over the last decade, that's been added to the mix. And we've been involved in doing some of the OCD cases that led to FDA approval for o intractable OCD by the FDA under humanitarian device exemption, which is kind of the device equivalent of an orphan drug approval. And we've also done open label trials uh, at, at targets for major depression. Uh, those looked promising. Depression, because of its higher prevalence, could not be approved under an HDE, orphan. Uh, it needed a full pivotal trial in order to go forward. And so we just recently published the results of that, of that trial, and it was negative. So it was not effective for major depression. Um, and I guess bringing it back to this case, so that's kind of the framework that we work in. We meet monthly. I've done it for 15 years, and it's been around for 50 plus years, this committee. And Paul's joined us before uh, at our meetings. For this particular case, I would say our experience, we've done in the time that I've been on the committee, we have done surgery in, for Tourette syndrome in two cases. Um, the one I remember most vividly because it's the most recent but also the most graphic was a, a postdoc researcher within the partner system who had such severe um, movements, ticks over her heads that she was detaching her retina. And the, the ophthalmologist were going in and reattaching it but it kept detaching, and they said, we're not going to keep reattaching this unless we can somehow get the, the, the Tourette's syndrome under control. Now, she had tried pretty much all medication trials that are known to have any efficacy for Tourette's and had done the cognitive behavioral therapy. But it was, uh, it was really life-changing for her. She still ticks, but it's much more gentle. No risk, not, not nearly the violently enough to detach her retina. They've both been reattached and have remained reattached attached for the last five years, so we saved her sight, essentially. Um, but we've never done an adolescent, so I guess that's the gist of, of this. Now, we have done the anterior cingulotomy in patients as young as 16, so we do have that experience. We've done uh, two, two kids. One of the difficulties with, with kids and adolescents is usually the time it takes from onset of illness to correct diagnosis to going through each of the treatments, which can take, each one can take months, and then the behavioral therapy. Usually by the time they meet treatment criteria, they're not a kid anymore. So that, that happens, uh, so that's probably why we don't see it a lot. Of course, if you were to lower your threshold as to what you required in order to proceed with surgery, then it would not take as long. And that's happened in the epilepsy field. Uh, the resections and, and the like were all in adults, and then they realized, kind of comparable to this case, boy, this epilepsy, these people are in their developmental trajectory, and what we're doing is we're waiting for that all to finish, and then we intervene. What would be the implications if we were able to intervene earlier and change that tra trajectory for the better? And so epilepsy surgery has moved into the pediatric realm. And then, as Paul said, in dystonia, Dystonia, these, these people can get stuck in a certain position, like this, for example, that they can't get out of. And you can imagine a 14 year, 15 year old kid who's tried all the medications and, and the like. Do you wait until they're 18 years old, or do you leave them stuck in this position, unable to move any other way uh, for, th for three to five years? So I'm happy to answer any questions about our psychiatric neurosurgery committee um, and how we've done, but. That's kind of a framework on how at MGH we would handle this case. It would come to the Psychiatric Neurosurgery Committee and we would address it in that format. I'm trying to figure out how to turn this on, but I can yell too. You've got a good voice, I Libby. I have teenagers well, at of, home. Because of the webcast, I think we need to uh, sure make it work. All right. There we go. I think that's better. So one of my questions for you is how many cases do you do a year? Mm-hmm. We do um, two to six ablated procedures and two to six DBS cases per year. So we probably average one every one to three months. And we're a high volume tertiary care center. Our referrals are from all over the United States and the world. So it's not like this is a high volume business. Uh, good, very good point. So, but your, uh, your DBS program for non-psychiatric indication is a High volume. Very high yeah. volume. They're into, I, I believe, Ahmad himself, uh, our, the neurosurgeon that I've worked with for 15 years. He's done five to 700 cases himself. So 
So it's a very much higher volume. I just want to give a context that mm -hmm. uh, this isn't a, a place that does a, a couple of, of these surgeries a year. They know this technique, are expert in the world, but for this indication, right. it's very selective. Yeah, that's an important point because it's the same device that's used and has been implanted in over 100,000 people for Parkinson's disease, for example. I think they passed that milestone a couple of years ago, so it's even higher now. It's the same device. The only difference is the target is to, is to where the electrode is placed uh, for these alt alternate indications. So where do you put it in Tourette's? And how did you figure out in that case you mentioned mm -hmm. where to put it? Well, the good news for us is we weren't the first, and there were two targets where there is literature that suggests it could be helpful for Tourette's. And interestingly, on the two cases, we tried one target for one patient and one target for the other and found them both to be helpful anecdotally. But the two targets are the globus pallidus interna, so that's in the basal ganglia. It's also a common target for Parkinson's disease. You usually use the GPI or the subthalamic nucleus STN for Parkinson's. The other target is the central nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, there's a lot of evidence uh, in a lot of cases have been done at that target for Tourette's as well. And so we've done a case, uh, one case each at those two targets. Do you have any focused ultrasound? On the way. That's another technology. Um, so I'll say two things, be one thing before I answer that. Um, also, just remembering what Paul had on the slides, we did these cases as pure clinical cases. Uh, we didn't feel right given that we, they were kind of one-offs, like humanitarian exemptions for us uh, going out of our standard diagnoses that we should have any type of research. The benefit should all, have been, all be for the patient. And so we did not add any research burden to either of those two cases. And then your question was the focus ultrasound. There's new technology now where it's already been developed in the gamma knife neurosurgery, for example, where you have thousands of gamma rays going through the brain, and any one of them, the energy level is low enough, it doesn't affect the brain tissue. But stereotactically, you can, within a millimeter or two, define where the intersection of those gamma rays occur. And at that intersection, the energy level is, comfortable, is high enough that you can ablate brain tissue without having to do the burr holes in craniotomy. A new technology is the low field ultrasound. Uh, ultrasound's already used in a comparable manner. You think about a lithotripsy for, uh, for renal stones. But now, stereotactically, you can also use these ultrasound rays to do the same things with gamma that you can with the gamma knife. The advantage of the ultrasound is the lesion is immediate and it doesn't require radiation. What happens with the gamma knife is there's a high dose of radiation delivered at the intersect and the lesion doesn't develop immediately. It takes some months to develop. And if you look at the literature, occasionally it will overdevelop and they'll, they'll develop cysts. Uh, so you'll have a lesion larger than you, than you wanted to. And low field ultrasound looks like a way for us to achieve what we do with the gamma knife without the radiation and uh, overly enlarged lesions happening. So we're on the way to getting that technology as well. So can I follow up with one uh, mm -hmm. um, question? The, um, you did the two cases for clinical purposes. Mm -hmm. Didn't change anything to collect extra data. Right. Uh, but do you think, given that there are ones and twos and threes across the country, now that there is a Tourette syndrome DBS um, uh, database being, is there a positive obligation for you to contribute to that? Yes. And does that require you to go back and get consent from the patients? Mm -hmm. Or, um, and do you think that that should be a, is that a supererogatory, a, a, a special thing for the patients to do? Or do you think that's kind of sort of their duty because they benefited from a, a, a therapy like this? I think it's our duty to ask them and for them to consider it. But we would never, re if they are, were ever against us publishing or including their data in a database, we wouldn't do that. So in both of these cases, that's exactly what happened, Paul, is after we saw that they had improved, we got their consent to write them up and we published them both as case reports. And then we, the Tourette Syndrome uh, Association of America, the TSA, maintains and curates the the Tourette syndrome DBS registry, which just gets all of the cases, what the target was, what type of changes on the scales we use to, to monitor Tourette symptoms. And we added both of these patients, again, with their consent to the, to the TSA registry. 
And I think this becomes interesting if you now, in your next case, if you know what the data fields are for the registry, um, I imagine there's a temptation to say, this could contribute even more if we just collected, made sure we collected the fields that we otherwise may not have collected. And it, maybe it's good practice, maybe it's extra. But mm -hmm. uh, is there that um, incentive or, or temptation? There is. Um, fortunately, most of what the, the fields that are populated in the TSA registry, a lot of it is demographic. A lot of it is the, the target. And then where it gets tricky is the outcome measures. And so what we argue, and we can talk a little bit about this, is there's a TS scale that measures the severity of ticks in a quantitative measure. And it's used clinically to follow how people are doing with medication or with a specific type of CBT habit reversal therapy that's used for Tourette's. And so we justify using it because it's used for those things. But conveniently, it does fit nicely into the, into the registry. So there's a fine line there. We, we do think we're justified, but it would be, the case would almost be useless to the registry without that outcome data. So there's no doubt about that. So we're right on time, and I think well positioned to let Libby talk to us about the regulatory environment for, for this sort of thing. And Libby, uh, uh, there's any number of angles on this, but I, I think we'd love to hear a little bit about when innovative surgery has to be done under the auspices of research, when an off-label indication really crosses the line into something that needs to have a new investigative device um, protocol that it's associated with, uh, what the consent process might look like for, especially for an innovative surgery that's only been done once or twice or a few times, and what implications uh, arise when the subject is an adolescent. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot, you know, lots to handle, and if you've got other topics you want to tackle, those are good too. Wow. <laughs> um, first I'll say, any, either of you guys can join my IRB anytime. <laughs> Love to have you. Um, these are really challenging areas and, and uh, difficult to understand. From a regulatory perspective, I think um, it, it's very challenging. And I'm not sure if ev everybody is familiar with the HUDs, Humanitarian Use Devices, or HDEs, Humanitarian Device Exemptions, which is a relatively new thing at the FDA, um, probably since about 2000 or so, where um, devices which are not anticipated to be used in more than 4,000, that's a pretty big number, 4,000 people in the United States can go through this other pathway to approval. Um, and essentially what it requires is the company to generate some basic effectiveness and safety data in a small number of people. Um, and the neuropsychiatric devices are one example of this, the dystonia approval that was mentioned. Um, another approval is sort of just a few things, so you get the flavor of these, a uh, valve that's implanted, a one-way valve for people who ha keep having recurrent pneumothoraces, um, sort of really weird sort of things that don't happen very often. Um, a device used under these s needs to come through the IRB. They can't be used at the institution until uh, there is IRB review, and it has to be full panel review. We used to be able to do this by expedited review, saying it was, you know, clinical care, sort of. But they've, they've changed that, so it has to go full panel. Um, and then we get into the issue of whether you can use HDE devices off-label for care, not as labeled. And you can see how we get into these very complicated uh, sort of decision trees and thought processes. And, you know, we at the IRB do not regulate the practice of medicine. So um, there are certain things you can do um, with appropriate mechanisms and oversight and decision-making 
groups uh, at centers, and Darren's group is, is sort of like that. Um, another group that functions in that way are some of the committees that oversee challenging transplants at uh, our institutions. So you don't get a kidney transplant until you know that multi multidisciplinary kidney group um, looks at all of these different aspects of your case, which include some fairly squishy things like your psychosocial situation and are you gonna be able to afford and take your immunosuppressive drugs? So these are really challenging areas um, and I think it is incumbent upon us to have, uh, to do some of this work under clinical auspices but have a very formalized way of deciding who gets this and who's appropriate. And it is a multidisciplinary thing. And one of the questions I wanted to ask Darren was, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm not sure all you do, is what input does the kind of insurance you have or the ability to pay for these things um, play in these decisions? And I'm familiar with cases at both of the institutions where the physicians, the surgeons, the staff, and, and sometimes the companies will chip in and do some of these things in people who are so severely affected, and it appears that these, this is the best course of care in the situation where the person doesn't have a nickel and doesn't have insurance. And those are really challenging areas um, and probably the topic of a whole nother um, discussion. Um, in terms of deciding when to do something as care versus move into a formal clinical study, I think that's a really tough thing to make and a tough decision to make, and, and we have to think carefully about that, and then you have to think about the design of the study, which is some of the things you were mentioning, you know, how much does it add, how much burden, how much uh, sham, how much you know, everything, and, and how do we decide to do that? And that's really challenging and, and something we, we occasionally see, although I have to say, I think the majority of this work is currently proceeding as um, care. We do, and Children's Hospital has, um, a, another mechanism for oversight that we call innovative diagnostics and therapeutics. And we've had this on our books for a long time. And essentially what it does is allows a physician investigator to come to us with something that they believe is primarily directed at the care of the individual, but they'd also like to do some research component to it. Um, and sometimes it can be even a fairly significant research component in terms of blood sampling, scales, mandated follow-up, um, and so forth. Um, and that, that is a mechanism that we've used, and Children's has also um, kind of glommed onto, for want of a better word, um, to provide some additional oversight of challenging cases that span this um, bridge between something that's done exclusively for cl clinical care and something that's research. In our policy, we have a very strict limit of, of three is the maximum number th of these that you can do. Um, we have a way that they're reviewed. It requires multiple physicians agreeing that it's an appropriate approach for the patient. We think about how consent is obtained and, and so on. So that is one way to, to uh, look at these challenging situations, um, I would caution that you need to be pretty careful to uh, be sure you're staying on the right side of the FDA regs um, in not sort of doing de facto device research requiring an IDE. And I will also, maybe one of my final comments after I talk a little bit about the consent, um, I will say that the FDA has been clear in my dealings with it that they want the IRB to make their best decision about whether something needs uh, to interact with them or not. 
So we get first crack at it. If we don't know, we can refer it to the FDA for their opinion, and then the investigator or physician is obligated to go to the FDA. Um, I will say we've made a lot of these decisions. I think most of the time we make them right. Um, there's a couple situations where we've made them wrong, where we at the IRB said, no, we don't think an IDE is needed there. We think you can go ahead. This is close enough to the label. We think this is good enough. And I'll just give you an example of this. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the power morselation thing where you put a stick blender into somebody's abdomen and grind up uterine tumors and suck them out. And so you only have to have a tiny little incision instead of a huge one to take out that football-sized fibroid. Okay, So we actually said that doing that inside a plastic bag that's labeled for intra-abdominal use does not require an IDE. We made that decision. The FDA came back to us and said, you're wrong. We think that plastic bag requires an IDE. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they did not cite us or inspect us or in any way criticize us because we had carefully thought through that and made our decision and documented it and thought about it carefully. Um, so, so these are challenging um, things to do. Um, I think the functional neurosurgery is a lot uh, easier than the plastic bag for uh, fibromas, but um, you know, we do take our, our job pretty seriously. Um, and if necessary, we can get outside consultants and others to opine on particularly challenging things that we get. I guess my final comment before we open it up would be, um, hearing the case, I was personally quite disturbed by the concept that somebody could reject CBT. And um, that, I, I think our IRB would really choke a bit on that one. Um, and to say that we're gonna go uh, into a teenage brain um, where Perhaps the parents have rejected a modality that might benefit this child. Um, that might be something where I would be thinking about an independent advocate, uh, a guardian, other ways to think about um, how we might treat such a patient in a multimodal way. And, and the fact that you could out of hand reject something that, at least from my knowledge, is, is fairly effective in many different areas of psychiatric disease, including things like OCD, I would have some serious concerns about that, and I think our neuropsychology folks would as well. So I guess I'll stop there, and maybe we'll open it up. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can pick up that thread in a moment, but just before we leave you, could you just say a, a word for the folks who aren't real familiar with uh, consent in the context of research protocols when it comes to children and adolescents, sort of what the, what the standard is for, I think in this case it would be one parent and the child assenting, but could you sort of lay out the landscape for everyone? Yeah, so I have to look it up every time we do it because we don't do that much pediatric research, but there's the 404 to, to 407 criteria in the federal regs that we need to look at um, in terms of minimal risk, minor increase over minimal risk, and whether or not there's a benefit to the individual child or the group of children, or for example, children with Tourette's. And we need to consider who consents and who assents in that context. And um, essentially, if there's presumed benefit to the child um, and a minimal increase over minimal risk, we can have one parent. Um, I think with more than minimal risk, you need both parents. Um, and then we need to consider the assent issue. And certainly in a 15-year-old, we would always require um, assent. We generally stick with the sort of standard age of seven being um, an age where a child can at least verbally um, assent. We usually um, in a study like this, we would certainly request a uh, written assent process, and we would also likely require that the child sign 
the full-on consent form because our consent forms are supposed to be written at a eighth to ninth grade reading level. So unless the child were severely developmentally delayed or some other reason, you would expect that this 15-year-old would actually be reading and signing an adult consent form. Um, in, in just a moment, I'm gonna open it up, but I, I don't wanna lose the thread of, of the issue of whether, whether the family needs to consent to trying all non-surgical therapies uh, before, before they can proceed to a semi-innovative, perhaps part of a research protocol, brain surgery. And Paul, I know this is partly a, a deliberate uh, uh, technique to, so that we can sort of pick that up and, and consider it. Are there types of reasons that the family could give that you think would be compelling and types of reasons that where you think we would you know, have to override their refusal of, of CBT? Uh, or is it all one way or all the other way? Or? So I, 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 I perfectly appreciate that. And, and you look at the paradigm of uh, blood products for Jehovah's Witness patients, and oftentimes they'll override a parent's uh, objection. Um, in this case, um, if it's the core belief of the parents and the child is espousing this as a core belief, uh, do you think that cognitive behavioral therapy is going to be, be helpful in a child who rejects it and won't participate? You know, is it sufficient that a treatment has failed if a patient has been non-compliant or doesn't want that modality? There, there is a certain, even in epilepsy, they'll say, well, they failed it because they didn't like the regimen of so many times a day they couldn't keep it track. So I, I think one way to, to ask yourself is that uh, what's the likely success? So. You ask the, the psychiatrist and psychologist, even if they were compliant, what would be the success? And are you asking them to do a futile thing if you, they have a spouse that they, not only do they don't want it, if you force them to do it, they won't really try, or they'll only pretend to try. And how successful is cognitive behavioral therapy if you don't try, right? Blood, you, you put it in the veins and it's there. This, this, this is a therapeutic relationship. So it doesn't trouble me um, at the outset uh, the interesting question for my mind is how persuasive, convincing, coercive should the clinician be to get the, the, the child and the parents to agree? You know, what is the boundary between being an advocate as a, as a physician and changing their mind for what you think is less risky, better, and when does it become not respecting their core central beliefs about talk therapy or behavioral therapy? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say I, what I know what our committee would do. So uh, I'll throw it out there, and then we can talk about it. Um, we would probably do what Libby said. We would say that we're, we're not going to proceed with this case if you don't try one of the gold standard first-line treatments. The habit reversal therapy is at least as beneficial as medications. And if you look at the effect sizes, it might even be a little more beneficial. So they've been through a lot of medication trials with a certain likelihood of being effective. But the whole other side, the other first-line treatment, which might even be a little more effective, they're refusing to do. And it does tend, come down to autonomy, because then you're, they're saying, no, I'm not going to do it. We're saying, you need to do it. But at the end of the day, they don't have to do it. They just won't get the procedure. So, and then just one other point. Sometimes you will see, especially in adolescents, I'm not going to do therapy. 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 They go to therapy. I'm not going to do therapy. The second session, I'll kind of try this therapy. The third session, they're doing therapy. So, um, so I think it would be worthwhile to kind of push that, individ that kid into, into therapy. So I end up seeing the 0.1% of a population where best efforts fail and, you know, the ethicist comes in when there's intractable conflict many mm -hmm. times. Um, so if there really is intractable conflict and you know that you have a window to help them through this developmental stage, you're willing to say, we're not gonna offer you this potentially therapy during this window if you're not gonna do this other, this other therapy. I we're think gonna withhold, knowing that you'll never try the best thing, we're still gonna withhold this second best thing. We would like, that would likely be our committee's decision historically. Um, We've made exceptions sometimes if there's a really good reason. Sometimes we've had people, I mean, one way through this are people who either don't want to or aren't good at doing the behavioral therapy component. 
they'll try it and they'll say it wasn't effective or their therapist will say they weren't motivated and then we say they tried it. It's hurt. There starts to be some gray area there. Same for ECT for depression. We typically require, but we've had a few cases where the individual just is firmly against doing ECT, which we typically require before neurosurgery for depression. And so we do take it case by case. There are, it, it is variable, but most of the time we would require that they, that they do the treatment with, with rare exceptions. A wonderful talk. Just a uh, quick question. You know, um, I recall a case, you know, when we do neuropathology at the Boston City Hospital, one guy had a bilateral, uh, you know, proteinosis on the amygdaloids, you know, both mm -hmm. sides, and, uh, you know, uh, they report a, uh, you know, kufer bucy like syndrome, you know, licking everything in the bed uh, before he died. And... Um, my quick question is that, you know, when you mention you um, use abrasion to remove the central part, I believe the probably the output. Oh, no, the thalamus. Mechanism. Thalamus. Oh, thalamus, not thalamus, amygdala. Thalamus, I'm sorry. <laughs> I might have said wrong, but it's okay. not central yes, nucleus right, right. of the thalamus. So, uh, so there's still a lot of bearings uh, on the side. And, you know, my quick question is that do, what kind of adverse event in after the... Uh, you know, cycle or neurosurgery? I mean, mostly you'll come in and find. For, yeah, know, great question. Industry, right? The procedure is usually done uh, while patients are awake. They have a stereotactic frame. It, all they require is lidocaine. I mean, people are amazed that neurosurgery, all you need is some lidocaine. But you have the lidocaine where you screw the, the, the frame onto the skull. The bone and the brain don't have any sensory neurons. So all you really need to do is anesthetize the skull. And then you, you do an incision and retract the scalp, and then you drill bilateral burr holes. And then through those burr holes, because of the frame and imaging, you know an X, Y, and Z coordinates within about a millimeter as to where you're gonna put your tip. And that tip can either be put in place and it's insulated except for the tip and you heat it up in a plate, or it can be an electrode where you know where the tip is going and you, and you leave it in place. Patients are awake and they usually go home within 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, so it's actually a pretty standard procedure with low risk, but not no risk. 1% of patients will experience seizures. 1% of patients will uh, develop an infection. Those rates are no higher or lower than craniotomy for any other purpose, whether it's for hematoma evacuation or AVM fix, or, but you do have that risk. Um, but other than that, um, other than the standard craniotomy risk, they, there, there's no higher than than other craniotomies. Yeah. Now for the psychiatric indications, are you doing post-operative adjustments of which leads are on, you know, what the firing rates yeah, are? Yeah, I could describe that as well. That's quite intensive. What we have is bilateral, we have electrodes with the tip at a specific target, and each electrode has four contacts. And each of those contacts is going to hit different fibers of passage that connect brain networks, different brain areas. And the, the idea for DBS is to hit white matter fibers of passage rather than one node in a circuit, because it allows us to better affect the whole circuit instead of just one node. And there's anatomic variability as to where people's fibers that connect different brain regions are. So we have to spend three to six hours, uh, usually in multiple sessions, exploring each of the different electrode combinations at different frequencies, pulse widths, and amplitude. And 90% of the time we'll try settings and nothing happens. And the 10% is really where the money is, because then we'll see either adverse events, stimulating the ventral contacts for psychiatric illness can cause autonomic symptoms and fear, heart rate, you've probably seen that before, Paul. And that we also find the ones where they say, oh, wow, I feel better. Um, and it's pretty dramatic. These people will say, oh, I haven't felt this good in 10 years. And we're like, bingo. And we'll identify a few of those, and the one with the biggest effect is plan A, and we'll leave it on and chronically stimulate at those contacts. And most of the time that'll be effective, but if it doesn't, we have from, from having screened the entire parameter space, we have other, con other parameters that also had beneficial effects, and we can then move to a, a prolonged trial at plan B, C, et cetera. Thanks, my question is for Dr. Ford. I wanted to ask you if you could say a little bit more about core beliefs, 
sort of which you raise as a way to sort of fill out the case with re wanting to reject cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, but I'm curious, what is a core belief and how do you sort of distinguish that from other beliefs and why does that, why does that matter? Yeah. So I, I use the language of core belief opposed to religious belief. Uh, because I take religious belief for many people to be an expression of their most central beliefs that they don't want to violate. So think about those things that you're not willing to give up or willing to, to give up very little of in order to, uh, to accomplish other goals. So how do you tell them when you talk to people, you know, this is what I, what I think our conversations are often, what are you unwilling to risk? You know, patient, uh, Parkinson's patient who said his favorite thing to do was to, uh, to tell stories to his kids. If, there's, if he can become dysarthric because of the surgery, um, he chose not to move forward because it was so core to tell his grandkids stories that he didn't want to interfere with his voice. Right? Uh, Jehovah Witness, we often think about as, as some people in Jehovah Witness faith, their core belief is not to have blood products. So you picked up on my language of core belief because I want to sort of expand it to say the things that center us and that we want to, uh, uh, that we ought not to violate in one another, that we should respect. Yeah, that then raises the question, whose core beliefs are important here? The case is written in an interestingly intricate way. The kid sees the thing on television and says, I want this surgery. You've got a developmental window for his adolescent development, to be sure, but you also have an adolescent window of, um, their ability to interpret the news. So the kid's now pushing for it. The family brings him reluctantly. The parents bring him reluctantly. And the text says, the family doesn't believe in CBT. Now, I don't know what the kid thinks about all this. And of course, it's almost impossible to figure out what the kid thinks if the parents are saying they all feel something else. Um, and I mean, he's not an emancipated minor. He's a kid brought by his parents I don't know who's running the show here, but I feel very uncomfortable, as many of you do, in, in this juxtaposition of things that complicate it. I must say, the decision-making process and the, the rest of the technical discussion I found absolutely fascinating. So if the rest of the group doesn't want to go to the core values or the thing, I can't understand. But whose core values count, the 15-year-old or the reluctant parents? So, so the That's answer is yes and yes. Um, <laughs> so in our... Uh, um, in our setting, we also have multidisciplinary committee um, that I am a member of. Uh, we have a neuropsychologist, we have a psychiatrist, we have a neurologist, um, um, neurosurgeons, and uh, oftentimes they will bring a case like this to the, uh, the committee for discussion, and then we'll have a variety of us talk with, in this case, the, the kid, his parents, um, to try to get out how do we balance not just the core values in any one person, but the core values of the team, the surgeon needs to balance his value of not uh, killing a kid for a, a, a benefit, for a social benefit, right? So that, I, I think it's a, a great question, you, you have to talk to people to see where that intersection is. Maybe there's an intersection between the child and the, and the parent, but not between that, that mode, that node, and the team. And so it may be that this is the wrong center, or maybe the team has an obligation to convince them otherwise, or maybe the team has an obligation to send them to another center that, that their core values may match up. And, uh, um, but the answer is uh, each, each member around the table, the patient, the, the parents, all are moral agents with different roles and obligations and responsibilities, depending on where they're, they're sitting and which hat they have on. And uh, we need to find a way to talk about these and come to an agreement and transparent about the justification and um, consistency from this patient without insurance to this patient with insurance. So this was not my actual question, but I want to follow up with you, Sai. I think you were pointing a little bit to the difference between the core values of a uh, 15-year-old and the core values of the parents. So we've had cases in which we've allowed a 15-year-old to refuse selective 
um, brain surgery for eliminating seizures that his parents very much wanted him to have. And the question here would be, could the child ask for something and could his parents be the veto on the basis of their core values, mm -hmm. thinking maybe that his core values aren't really deeply grounded in the same way that perhaps his parents are. Is that what you were trying to get outside, the difference between the parents and the child? Oh, a dozen pieces in my question. That's part of it, yes. Where, where this question comes up for me is when you have a standard temporal lobe epilepsy lesion with, um, with MRI abnormalities, the SPECT scan, that everything points that the state of the art best thing for this kid is to get this. You know, that, that standard, at least one uh, randomized controlled trial, only one, but, um, but you know, the ideal candidate. Mm -hmm. um, when it's an innovative neurosurgery, I think we hold this to a different standard. And I think that all parties have to be in some agreement that this is really the best interest of this child. Because the very decision-making questions say they don't think you can demand it in that way. So this would be my you bring up a really interesting question, though. Let's say the, the whole resistance to the behavioral therapies of the parents and the kids gung-ho. He would try it out. Is there a mechanism by which you can offer cognitive behavioral therapy to the kid against the parent's wishes? I don't know. But that's, well, that's interesting, right? Because then you, first of all, it complicates the matter because you have different opinions within the family, but the patient wants it. And then how, if you can, can you get access to said therapy? to a minor against his parents' wishes. I don't know the answer to that. Against the parents? Then he comes home after a very successful session, and his parents do nothing but stop it. How effective is that? Yeah, it could also, they could undermine it. Yeah, exactly. So in some states, and Ohio is one of them, adolescents can get psychiatric care for a limited amount of time without disclosure to their parents, right? Uh, uh, for uh, alcohol, drugs, certain psychiatric indications, as well as uh, um, uh, reproductive. Uh, um, now, the, the, the question always comes, how do you do that and for the parents not to find out and is that really going to be effective? And So I think it's a nice set of questions. Yeah, it's a good questions. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what we think would constitute sort of genuinely informed consent in this case and what the obligation of the care team looks like. So we've talked a little bit about the difference between the expectations of the parents and the child. So maybe one obligation would be to bring them a bit closer together and their expectations. But what about risk then? Um, what would it take to really adequately inform this family about the risk of the surgery? So there's been nine published cases of this. Do so you go through each kind of case with them and describe the different situations behind these cases? Or do you just kind of say, look, we really don't know, um, given the evidence we have, what, um, what the long-term risks are? And maybe we don't really know what the short-term risks are either, given the limited you know, evidence we're working with. Yep. I can address that if you guys want me to. Um, so for the OCD cases, it was approved by under an HDE based on 26, an open label study of 26 patients. And so this, is, this would be nine instead of 26. And the, what we have in our consent form is because that's not a large number, we also include the risk associated with DBS for, we just think for um, relatively equivalent procedures. So we present the known risk for a much larger data set for DBS for other indications. So just putting an electrode at a target, but a target nonspecific. We include in the risk, risk, risk section the ablative procedure risk, since it's another craniotomy for this risk. And then, of course, we include any of the adverse events that were reported in those 26 patients. And then every year when we do our continuing review, if there's any new evidence that's come out or any more, we have to add so that it's constantly updated. And so that's how we handle it. And it's actually a pretty long section. Um, we also, for these psychiatric indications, require a, a third-party independent consent monitor to be present. And they uh, attend the session. And then we leave the room, and they have a way to a formalized way to debrief to make sure that understanding was there for this, you know, more vulnerable population with psychiatric illness. So um, that third-party um, consent, I'm not sort of 
um, under, so I, I do some of that. I'm, I'm not really third party, but I'm also not paid for through the Neuro Institute. I, I'm, I'm paid for through the Chief of Staff's office. And so I have an independence, although not complete independence, but they uh, employ, sort of not employ, they, they have me uh, meet with many of their research subjects for OCD and previously for depression mm -hmm. to try to give this even-handed um, uh, discussion uh, not try to convince them not to have surgery, but um, one technique I would use in, in this case is that to highlight to them, nine cases are reported in the literature. In general, the literature tends to report the positive, the more positive cases. So we can't assume there's a lot more, but anecdotally we know there are others, and we have to realize that those others may be worse, in fact. And so maybe I lay crepe a bit, um, it's my job to, mm -hmm. um, to tell them that, uh, uh, to help with that consent to say, that new story you saw, those magical stories, are, you, are not the typical, you know? And even those folks the literature say still struggle. It's not that they're magically cured. So it's to help the child and the parents um, um, assess that there is genuinely unknown risk and it's probably not as good as what, uh, what, what it seems. And if the thing were to come to the full IRB as a full study, we have the option to require an advocate, an independent person to fulfill that role, to be a consultant to the patients, the families. Um, an advocate can have different roles, either sometimes to educate, assess, inform independently. Um, they're often very sophisticated individuals. They often have psychiatric or ethics training formally so they can uh, really assess understanding and vibes and, and the like. It's very uncommon that we actually mandate that, but occasionally we do. An example of a case where we did that was um, the uh, total artificial heart study way back when that was done at one of our institutions and the company, um, which is actually a, a Massachusetts company, had actually built that into their project and the person was um, a physician uh, who had psychiatric training and they actually were paid to perform that role. I have a quick clarification question, question Darren. Um, you mentioned that the protocol, the, the procedures that you've done were not done under a research protocol, but then you mentioned the consent process being, you know, a, using a document that gets continuing review each year, which suggests that that is an IRB approved consent form. Yeah, it's part Good. of a protocol. Yeah, I'm glad for the clarification. So it's, that's for the OCD cases, which is IRB approved under the HDE. For the Tourette's, we handled it as a standard clinical consent. Okay. Great. Yeah. Hi, thanks. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about you know, what special role, if any, DBS is playing in this case, uh, or is it kind of a, a placeholder for any um, innovative neurosurgery, say, if, if it was gamma knife, would, would you think about the case similarly? For example, you know, often one thing that's brought up is people say, well, DBS, that's, that's more reversible than, than some of these other surgeries. That's a good point. Do you want that or you want me to? Um, so I, I, I think you, you, you highlight it's a, a reversible but also um, a modifiable, you know, gamma knife, you drop it in and it expands and, or even the, uh, the other blade of surgery, you, you, you difficult to, to reverse. So people are less hesitant perhaps to do, put this in that knowing that it's probably going just going to leave a small lesion even though there's infection risk. And so uh, it pushes the risk assessment, so maybe it's a little more permissible. We wouldn't think of burning a hole in this kid's brain, but maybe a little hole with a lead in it might be, uh, might be justified. Yeah, microlesion during implantation, which is usually has no clin clinical sequelae, and then it's reversible. Um, th for a kid, I think you would want to go that way. It's interesting, though, in the cases that come to our committee, about half the people, we give options to do an ablative or deep brain stimulation. And about half of the participants uh, or the candidates say, you know, I really like the idea of this, being able to take this out if it doesn't work and just return to normal. Um, I don't want to have a lesion burned in my 
head that's not reversible. I like the idea that there's parameter space that you can explore instead of binary, just you have tissue or you don't. And that's perfectly reasonable. Then we have people who say, wait, if I have deep brain stimulation, you have to leave this in my brain the rest of my life, and I have to come in and have it adjusted, and sometimes you have to change the battery and I have to undergo general anesthesia. I'm thinking I like this one and done deal. And so it's very interesting. Um, people, and I think they're both entirely reasonable conclusions, but people, it's funny how people tease out into one or the two, and we typically, typically if they're eligible for one, they're eligible for the other, and we just usually, uh, you know, respect their wishes and do the procedure that they choose. So I, had, I just had a quick question about your thoughts on the sort of responsibility or ethics of the manufacturer in this case. It was just sort of surprising to me that you haven't, after all this experience, don't have as much systematic evidence about these patients to to provide to this patient because of, you know, it seems like, you know, it's entirely dependent on your publishing your experience with this and not the manufacturer that is, you know, getting the profits from this device being implanted, maintaining its own registry or helping in this process at all. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I guess I'm, I was just interested in, you know, if there's any role, I mean, I know that there are some responsibilities that HDEs then give to manufacturers to do post-approval studies and stuff like that, and I guess I was just wondering what, how their relationship is with all this. Yeah, I'm, they're really only, only on the hook for things where they have the FDA indication. And if any clinician uses it off-label, they're off the hook. Just with me, same with medications. Um, um, so e equally, though, I, I think that there's a really interesting initiative with the, uh, the Brain Initiative and the NIH. Um, part of the reason that you see this is it's very difficult often for individual clinicians, researchers, to um, use, to get an IDE on a device that's already been approved because they need to get a letter of, um, write a reference mm -hmm. from the, the drug company, or from the manufacturer, that will allow the FDA to use the past data. So if you're a surgeon who wants to say, I'm gonna do this the best way, I'm gonna do this as a rigorous trial, the amount of paperwork and negotiations with a big company is, is incredible. So they're It'll trying It'll never to, happen. <laughs> but, but there's an initiative right, right now uh, with the NIH and the, the brain um, initiative that devices that already have one indication, that they'll standardize the legal agreements, the intellectual property, the right of references, to try to fund and encourage individual researchers to do something like yeah. a new indication. So the protect the liability of the company, it's not an indication that's going to be enough to, to justify the millions and millions of dollars of, of research, but also gives them an opportunity to stand aside and let the, the uh, individual researcher get NIH funding and, and actually do it. So there's this disincentive that we need to remove if we expect people to do more research that's yeah. indiv individually do. Oh yeah, right on target. And I know you went to the industry NIH thing that was essential to that. Yeah, this is a, a morass and the companies view it as just a downside for them and you know, we spent a fair amount of time wrangling with some of these companies to let us do things, even do things that seem like no-brainers, like putting somebody's, replacing somebody's battery, mm -hmm. and, you know, who's benefited from one of these devices. So this is a really challenging area, and I might add the right-to-try legislation that's coming forward, um, which kind of blows my mind as a physician where they're saying, you know, and this is moving forward in a number of states, where you as a patient have a right to demand access to certain therapies or devices, and there's no consideration of, you know, what it would actually take, what a caregiver would actually need to do, how this goes through the FDA, who bears responsibility, the manufacturer, the investigator, the patient. So it's, it's sort of a, a clash of cultures and, and um, very challenging area to negotiate. So I have, I have one last question, but I, I want to just tell everyone that <clears throat> we do have dinner available uh, at 6 in the Modell Room, which is right back behind this auditorium. All are welcome, whether you 
told us that you wanted to come or not, whether you knew about it beforehand or not, we'll have enough food for everyone. And it'll be a chance for everyone to continue the conversation in a slightly less formal fashion. Um, sorry, webinar participants, you can't come to the dinner. <laughs> um, so, um, Darren, when you, when, when you first said that we did, we did these uh, procedures for the Tourette's cases outside the context of research, I bristled. I said, really, you, you aren't contributing that research to, to the field? And then I was mollified when you said that you published the cases and they agreed to publish the cases. So I was, I'm, I'm curious, maybe this would be an unusual family, but if you, if you had had a family that said, we don't, we don't want you to share information about us with other centers, we don't want you to publish information even if it's de-identified, I, I could imagine if I were in the position of doing this surgery, I'm, I might want, feel tempted to insist that you allow us to, uh, sh to share de-identified information about your procedure just because, it's, because this is novel, other people are doing it, um, and they need to benefit from, from this knowledge. Would, uh, what's your take on Yeah, that? it's a real tension because you're giving these, the, the, the individual patient opportunity and access to a treatment that's not often available. Um, we wouldn't be offering unless we thought it was helpful. So we're giving them, it doesn't mean that there aren't unpublished cases and maybe it's, uh, literature looks better than the real deal. But still, we're offering that and it, it seems, it would seem somewhat petty for that individual completely identified to not allow us to share that to help with the general good. So we would be bothered by that. But at the end of the day, because we're doing it for clinical care, we'd have to just bite the bullet, swallow, and offer the clinical care. But it would be, you know, it'd be a tragic loss of information for the scientific literature. But we would not let that deter us from going forward for what is primarily a clinical indication. So does it change your mind if the patient and their family doesn't have insurance and you've cobbled together your resources that you could give to one family to, to give them access? You've gotten the device company to donate it. Does it make any difference to their obligation to share it if you now have, have the opportunity to give yeah, them question. the resources? And when does that become co unduly coercive and uh, yeah. invasion of privacy? Yeah, I have to take the patient who's in front of me. Um, so that would, that would be my answer. And sometimes we have had to do that cobble, like, can we please have a free device? Hospital, can we still please have some free OR time? Um, but you know, you have to treat the person in front of you. So I think you just have to take the hit. So I, we are right at, on time. Uh, that was a perfect You're right. uh, ending to, I think, a really terrific session. I'd like us all to thank our speakers for a great <laughs> seminar.